Back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, and Mr. Blazier and Mr. Sheck, people represented by Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Darden. The record should reflect the absence of Ms. Clark. Mr. Darden, I understand that Ms. Clark is ill today. All right, and my understanding is that you wish to uh, proceed in her absence uh, and request that I advise the jury that she's not available today, but the prosecution chooses to go forward. All right. All right, the record should also reflect that we have had an in-chambers uh, conference uh, regarding a uh, item in the newspaper which slipped by our censors. And... Uh, We've interviewed the uh, jurors who uh, had access to that, and I requested counsel to confer and see if there's any further requests for any inquiry. All right. Mr. Darden? All right, and I'm referring to the uh, Mike Peters cartoon in the August 23rd edition of the Los Angeles Times. All right, Mr. Cochran, I take it you have no personal objection to that? No, Your Honor, I, I'm, I'll be representing uh, that individual soon, so I'll be no, I, I have no objection to that. All right, since you were the person involved. Yes, no problem. All right, if, if I were you, I would have found it both humorous and complimentary. Yes, I, Your Honor brought it to my attention, but I have to see it, right. so, so I appreciate it. All right, that's the only part of the Times I read these days. Mr. Blazier, all right, we need to go on to the uh, swatch drying experiment uh, argument. Do you have anything else before we launch into that? Yes, very briefly. Uh, I filed a brief this morning with respect to the uh, discovery uh, violation slash sanction. I wouldn't go, I would not call that a brief. I would call that a tome. Well, the, most of its attachments is just a copy of the notes that supposedly the fact were described. That it's an inch and a half thick. Well, here's what I'm suggesting. The, the brief is only nine pages, but what I'm suggesting is uh, I can't imagine that the prosecution is going to be able to show any harm from what turns out to be 21 pages that relates to Dr. Lee's testimony, all of which was contained in his report. If the court is going to consider imposing any kind of instruction or any other sanction, I would ask that you review that prior to doing it. Otherwise, I would suggest that you defer this until you have more time. It's, it's not worth the time, quite frankly. But if you're going to impose anything, I, I would request that you review it. May I respond right. to that briefly, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we pre uh, prepared a list yesterday, actually. Um, Ms. Martinez prepared this for me, of the items that Dr. Lee testified to and the references to those items in various reports. In other words, it correlates the materials that we previously provided to the court by dividing them by subject matter. And I'm wondering whether the court might want to take a, a, a look at that and have a copy of that uh, document. Yes. The, the other thing is, Your Honor, uh, we would like to take a look at researching the issue of motions to reconsider. I, I've done this before and argued this before, but not for uh, a couple of years. And there are uh, provisions either in the rules of court or the Code of Civil Procedure dealing with when it can or cannot be done. And uh, perhaps we should do that before the court undertakes the process of reading this brief. Well, Mr. Goldberg, let me tell you frankly what my thought process is, and maybe this will help you. In fashioning any sanction, it's important to know what the nature of the harm was and what the prejudice was, which is why I've asked you to respond in a specific, item-specific way. What is it about this particular item in Dr. Lee's notes the fact that you did not receive those notes until, uh, you know, the 8th of August or so, and the fact that Dr. Lee test started his testimony on, as I recollect, the 22nd, uh, what is it about that, that information and that 14-day period that didn't give you sufficient time to prepare or what came as a surprise or, um, you know, what do you have to do, say, for example, uh, Dr. Lee's testimony regarding possible other footprints, excuse me, shoe prints have to be precise on these things, whether or not you had off sufficient opportunity to uh, uh, send copies of these items to Mr. Boziak for his, to consult with him. That's what I want to know. I want to know what the nature of the prejudice is, and I understand you're going to file that sometime this afternoon. 
you want us to file it sometime this afternoon. No, I thought that's what I asked you to file. Uh, you asked us to file it, but, I, but as I recall from reading the transcript, you didn't give us a, a time deadline. Well, Dr. Uh, Lee, I assume, from our progress in the boards, uh, is probably two-thirds of the way through his presentation. Well, Mr. Sheck told me he, he is intending to finish by, by 12 o'clock, or maybe it will spill over a little bit. So the issue the is day. then whether or not okay. you're entitled to a delay to prepare. I, I understand. Right. But in, in terms of delay, Your Honor, just so the court knows, uh, although the people's position is that perhaps we've been irreparably, irreparably prejudiced, nevertheless, from a tactical perspective, we do not want any kind of an extensive a gap between the end of Dr. Lee's testimony and the beginning of uh, our cross-examination. So uh, at, at most, I mean, it, it, it is our hope that we can go uh, as soon as possible, as soon as possible being at the latest sometime very early next week. And now I know that the court also has this issue of Furman and that we have to work around that as well. I would like the opportunity to consult more with Ms. Clark about this. This is a tactical decision in which, in effect, we may decide to forego certain remedies that the court would otherwise believe us to be entitled to in terms of a continuance. But if, if and let me let me just add one other factor for you to uh, consider. My impression from observing the jurors, and unfortunately you weren't privy to our discussion with one of the jurors this morning, but my impression is that they are tired, and we they are. Um, I wouldn't say close to the brink, but they're certainly within eyesight. We and understand. And, and that's why we're balancing what is the additional benefit we get from more preparation against the detriment that would be suffered by having uh, Mr. Lee's, uh, Dr. Lee's testimony mm -hmm. not subject to cross-examination. But do and, you really, and also the jurors. But let me ask well. you this. Do you really want to do anything more in this situation than have Dr. Lee accentuate the positives that, that go to your case? For example, his apparent opinion that these are Bruno Modley shoes and that although these appear to be parallel patterns, he can't say for sure that it's a shoe print. It looks like a shoe print, but he can't say for sure. Your Honor, these are the kinds of tactical issues that are going in. And I, what I'm trying to indicate to the court is that our, our tactical belief and indication mm -hmm. is we want the cross-examination to go at some time very, very early next week. Mm -hmm. And I'd like the opportunity to discuss that with Ms. Clark I understand and that. tell the court about our answer this afternoon. But if that is the case, does the court want me to use a substantial amount of my preparation time right now going through these documents in order to provide the court with a more detailed list of prejudice? I, I would no, prefer... If you, if you represent to the court that you're, it's your position now that you would you desire to proceed as quickly as possible without asking the court for any substantial delay then my preference is that you spend your time doing that well that, that because would be frankly my... if I were in your shoes um, this I would cross-examine dr. Lee for about half an hour accentuating the positives of my case doing it in a very professional friendly manner with him given his reputation and get out. Thank you, Your Honor. What I would do. Uh, thank you. And um, we will certainly consider the court's uh, comments, and, and I understand exactly what Your Honor is saying. And my representation is, yes, we have every intention and expectation of not asking. We are not going to ask for any significant delay, and we have every expectation of going forward at some time in the early part of next week. And I would like to, to spend my time in preparation rather than <laughs> sanctions, and then address we will be asking for other kinds of sanctions in the way of jurors, instructions, and so on. But I'd like to concentrate on that after uh, right. Dr. Lee's testimony, if we may. All right, then let's proceed to the argument regarding uh, sock drying. Your Honor, just in that regard, uh, I know I spoke to Mr. Goldberg about this, and he was indicating to me that he was, uh, uh, well, I don't want to characterize it, but Monday was likely. Uh, what we would just like to know, maybe you can tell us, he indicated to me he wants to speak to Ms. Clark and by sometime this afternoon, Dr. Lee is going back to Connecticut. He has very important business and he, he needs to know from purposes of scheduling. Our position about prejudice is contained in the papers Mr. Blazier filed. Uh, 
but w we would just like to know something by this afternoon so that we well, can make I, appropriate I plans. I assume that it, just as a matter of courtesy, Mr. Goldberg will try to give us some information in that regard by this afternoon. Your Honor, one uh, point, this uh, quick point before we proceed to uh, the argument on the swatch drawing having to do with the next board that's coming up. I just have a, a quick question, and that is this. Which board is this? This is the Rockingham board. You have it in front of you. The, I noticed last night that uh, the Rockingham the, board. Right. The, which one are we referring to? It, it's only one board, and the it, only Rockingham board I have is History of Socks. No. Wait, 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 wait. This is the front foyer? That's correct. If right. you uh, look at the picture on the bottom right, uh, Dr. Lee's testimony will concern uh, finding three other small uh, blood drops, uh, or finding additional ones other than the ones that were collected. And he saw outlines of the ones that were collected. I'm, he was not going to testify to any positive presumptive tests that he performed at that time. He will be testifying to certain negative presumptive tests. I noticed in the bottom right-hand photograph that uh, where it depicts the location of the various drops, that there is a swab on the ground, which looks like or could be interpreted as a presumptive test. There's no intention to elicit any testimony about that and the results of those tests. Uh, but I had some concerns that if I displayed that photograph in that fashion that uh, the prosecution might contend that we had opened the door. And uh, if that, I just wanted to iron that out. If that's going to be the case, then we'll cover up that photograph. Uh, we have no intention of eliciting it. The other I thing that, that the swab is u being used as a pointing device something that just sort of came came to hand at that location rather yes. than the, the little red tapes and things? It, it, it serves that purpose there. Okay. Well, that's kind of an ambiguous response to the court's answer because you can clearly see that there is a very distinct and unnatural color on these swatches, a bluish-green tinge uh, that's caused with the uh, orthotolidine test that Dr. Lee performed. Uh, so it is, it is in some ways more distinctive looking than the phenothaline test results, which are pink and uh, could conceivably by a lay person be mistaken for blood. This cannot be mistaken for blood. This is clearly the result of a presumptive test. Um, it would be our position that, that this does open up the door on a presumptive blood testing. I, I guess counsel could probably Cover up the um, the little the little cards with the Q-tips on them. I mean, that would be one way of handling it. What did we? Uh, Dr. Lee found other apparent blood stains. Did a test on them. What test did he do? He did an uh, he did an otolidine presumptive test on those stains. I mean, and what was the result? They were positive. I mean, there's there's I don't think there's any. Uh, difference between either side that uh, there were I believe three blood drops two or three on item number 12 three that were collected by LAPD in that location uh, and were confirmed later to be blood in fact there was an RFLP test done at Cellmark on item number 12 this was a high concentration of DNA Dr. Lee found three other small drops in that area applying another rule that we'd applied in this uh, with respect to uh, presumptive tests with the prosecution in the SOC, I, c I suppose I could argue that they could come in uh, on the grounds that it's all stains in the same area, but w we don't choose to elicit that it's a presumptive test. The only presumptive test that the jury has heard about, I believe, is the phenothaline test where the swatch turns red, and I think part of our concern with the other pictures where we struck them was that when you see a red swab, you might think it's blood and it's only a presumptive test. So we would, this photograph was there to just show the location. That's all he's going to testify to. And they are black. 
So that's the state of the record. I just uh, I don't want to open the door. So it's up to the court as to what you want to do with that picture. All right. Well, the court's ruling is pretty clear, though, on presumptive tests that are not backed up by a confirmatory yeah. test, since we're talking presumptive tests. We're not eliciting that test. Right. So if you want to use it, I suggest you uh, go along with the, you know, Dr. Lee can testify that he saw other reddish stains on the floor in close proximity to the three tested by the people. Uh, these are them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Referring to that photograph? Referring yeah. to that photograph, but I think Mr. Goldberg's suggestion that the cards be covered so that the uh, Q-tip isn't, uh, tip of the Q-tip isn't apparent. It's probably the way to go if you want to use the photograph. He can testify to that without the photograph. Can I just look at the board and see if sure. that's possible? Your Honor, it actually might even be possible for counsel to simply cover up the bluish green tinge. That way the jurors uh, would not know whether these were simply being used as pointers as opposed to the testing device. You can get some white out if such a thing still exists. All right. Sure. Mrs. Robertson, have we any white out? All right, let's go on to the argument regarding uh, swatch drying. Mr. Goldberg. Thank you, Your Honor. We uh, filed a brief on this, as, as counsel did. Um, counsel, in one of his arguments in passing, noted that the uh, People's Points and Authorities wasn't filed until a, a few weeks after we received discovery of the experiment. I don't think that that's really either here or there because we don't actually have to file written points and authorities in moving papers. This is something that we've been doing in your honors court, in this case, and flooding the court with paperwork. Mr. Goldberg, the only thing I'm interested in is whether or not you feel there's substantial similarity between the two situations. Okay, thank you. Uh, the people believe that there is not substantial similarity between the two situations, and there are several factors that are involved. Uh, actually, Mr. Sheck characterized most of them in his responses to them in his points and authority starting on page six. The issue as to whether the uh, swatch, the, the, the test tubes, and, and first of all, maybe I should start, start by explaining a little bit about the significance of this, or does the court already know what the defense theory is and why they want this to come in? Well, I have a, an idea as to why they want to bring it in just from looking at the exhibits. Okay. But seeing as how I'm the trial judge and not preparing the case, I don't know what the evidence is until it's presented to me at the same time the jury gets okay. it. Okay. The defense theory is that there, well, there are in fact transfer stains in bindle number 47, which is the bindle that contains Dennis Fung's initials and the item number on it. Therefore, it's an original bindle. This particular bindle was uh, created on June the 13th by Mr. Fung in the, in the morning, sometime after seven o'clock when, according to the door entry, he first went into the room. And obviously before 10 o'clock, which is when uh, Mr. Yamuchi sampled uh, the, the various evidence for the purposes of PCR testing. The bindle was then eventually booked into the evidence control unit where it's frozen, as the court has already heard in testimony. And that bindle, that particular bindle, remained in the possession of the Los Angeles Police Department until August the 12th of last year when it was mailed to the Department of Justice, or it was sent to the Department of Justice in an unfrozen condition. In other words, in a condition where it could thaw out and then was received by Mr. Sims of the Department of Justice. And he photographed it apparently before he did any testing on the same date. And that photograph depicts the transfer stain. So we know that the transfer occurred circumstantially at some time between June the 13th when the bindle was created and August the 12th when Gary Sims photographed it. 
the theory that the defense is propounding appears to be twofold, but either this is evidence of swatches being re-wet either intentionally or accidentally, probably more likely intentionally, and there, that counts for the, the transfer, or there was swatch switching. Uh, again, going to the, the issue of planting. All right, refresh my recollection as to 47. Is that one of the Bundy walkway drops? Yes, Your Honor. That's the first dot in the Bundy walkway. And it was also the subject of Colin Yamuchi's PCR testing. Now, the way that the swatches were dried out is they were put in the cabinet at the Los Angeles Police Department in the small test tubes, one of which we introduced into evidence. First, in looking at the photographs that, that were provided, and I, I could be wrong because I'm looking at photographs, it appears that the test tubes may be plastic instead of glass. Not sure whether that's material. And I can't tell whether the smaller test tubes are the identical size and whether the opening is the same as the LAPD test tubes. The LAPD test tubes are disposable glass uh, test tubes that are thrown away after the, the swatches are dried. So that's one point. The other point is that the LAPD test tubes are placed in the cabinet lying down, whereas uh, Dr. Uh, Lee's test tubes were upright. Now, I guess, I guess there are advantages and disadvantages to both, because you could argue that upright, for the purposes of contamination, that substances might be more likely to go into the test tube than lying down. But there should be a difference in airflow, and there could also be a difference in terms of precipitation, because if, if the, if the, uh, if the test tube is lying down, there's an effect of sealing and there is no ceiling if the test tube is standing up. And that appears to be a potential material circumstance. Uh, we, we also talked about not being able to replicate temperature and humidity. Council says that the lab was air conditioned. I don't recall that testimony. He doesn't have a, a citation in the transcript, and I don't know whether it was or not, but I don't believe it's in the record one way or the other. So trying to replicate the exact temperature and humidity uh, cannot be done. And we do know from the generic literature on, on drying experiments that this can play a very important role in terms of the length of time that it takes items to dry. The uh, next issue that we cannot determine, I'm not saying that they failed to determine this, I don't believe it can be determined or replicated, is exactly what proportion of distilled water to blood was used at the time that the swatches were collected in the field by Andrea Mazzola. And the court will recall the last two times we discussed the issue of drying experiments that there's some case law to the effect that where there are certain variables that cannot be determined, that those variables that cannot be re replicated are a basis for exclusion of the test as not being substantially similar. The uh, most important issue, as far as we are concerned, next to the issue of whether or not the test tubes were standing up or lying down, is the question of the swatches, the number of swatches in the test tubes. I am not positive, 100% positive, how the test was performed uh, from my discussions with Dr. Lee on, on this point. I now believe, based upon my most recent discussions, which was very, were very brief in this courtroom, that what he did in the case of, of the test tube, the single test tube that contained six swatches, which was the maximum number of swatches that any test tube contained, is that he put a number of swatches in that test tube because he wanted to be able to take one out each hour and then place it on a bindle for the purposes of seeing whether or not there was a transfer, which would necessitate, of course, opening up the cabinet, going into the, the test tube with a uh, forceps, presumably, taking a swatch out and testing it. Then the next hour, he'd take another swatch out and test it. Next hour, take another swatch out and, and test it to see whether there was a transfer. Obviously, none of that was done in our particular case the opening of the cabinet, the re-ventilation of the cabinet, perhaps redistributing the swatches in the course of plucking one of them out. And uh, 
what also was not done is in our particular case, in the case of 47, we have eight swatches in that particular tube. In fact, I think there were more swatches in that particular tube than any of the others, which could be uh, a reason accounting for the um, differences in drying time. One possibility that is probable, we believe, is that swatches become st stuck together in, in what I suppose we could call a swatch sandwich. And that the, the, the meat of the sandwich, as well as the bread sides that are facing the meat, are not going to dry as quickly as the exterior portions of the sandwich. All right. Well, Mr. Goldberg, you should assume that I've read your points and authorities, and right. thus far the arguments you made, um, I've heard okay. or I've read. Do you have anything additional you want to add to your points and authorities? Well, I don't think that I, 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 I took, I mentioned the fact of taking it one swatch out at a time and, and, and not keeping a bunch of swatches in a condition where they would be likely to be stuck together. And now, council no, says. To stuck together. Anyway. What? Never mind. I, I didn't. Okay. Uh, now, now, council says, well, well, some of these things, you know, there's no evidence for one way or the other, and the prosecution has to prove that it didn't happen. No, I think that the, that the obligation under the case law that we cited is for the proponent of the test to show the substantial material, the materiality of the circumstances, and to the extent that that cannot be done, the test should be excluded. This test appears to be more speculative than the sock drying experiment test. At least with the sock drying experiment, uh, at least some of them, it seemed like a crude attempt had been made to replicate the circumstances to the extent that the defense felt that they could be replicated. Here, the way that the test is designed, by its design, does not replicate all the material circumstances, particularly in ways that are important. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Goldberg <clears throat> indicates that at least one argument the prosecution will make and has made in its brief is the suggestion that the swatches were originally dry and then when they were put in the freezer and taken out of the freezer, condensation formed and that accounts for the wet transfer observed at the Department of Justice and is noted in the notes of Gary Sims. Uh, that argument is irrelevant to this experiment and this discussion because the point at issue here is whether or not the swatches on the morning of June 14th when taken out of the test tubes were wet or dry. That's the point in contention. The record here indicates that Andrea Mazzola testified in August that when she assisted Dennis Fung in removing the swatches from the test tubes, that she initialed the bindles, or she put her initials on at least some of the bindles. None of these bindles have her initials. That was established at this trial. We've also established at this trial, uh, through the testimony of Thano Paratus, that there's eight cc's of blood in the calibrated needle that he withdrew blood from Mr. Simpson, and we've established that uh, Colin Yamauchi used one cc when he made the swatch the Fitzko card, and that the next business record recording is toxicology, and they measured the amount of blood in the tube, and that's 5.5 milliliters. That means at least 1.5 milliliters of blood is missing. That is part of the background here. There is wet transfer on the original bindle 47. I don't think that's in dispute by any of their experts, and even from Mr. Goldberg's argument. The issue is, what could have caused that West transfer? We think that it's self-evident that, frankly, if you put swatches in a test tube in this fashion, they should dry overnight. It's the testimony of Dennis Fung and Andrea Mazzola that these swatches were, in fact, dry. They both testified to that fact. They both testified that the procedure involved, Mazzola is very specific in the page citations I put in the brief, that they would not put them in the bindles if they were wet. Colin Yamauchi testified that he noticed nothing unusual about the bindles when he cut the swatches. He further testified that with respect to another item, he did note 
when he did his drawings whether or not swatches were stuck together. In fact, I know the court recalls from our split hearing that there was one uh, set in particular where he noted the swatches were stuck together. So it seems to me that the record, as far as swatches sticking together or swatch sandwiches, uh, presumptively ba based on the testimony, uh, if there were swatches sticking together, they would be noted and when, and it was noted in the instance where it occurred, and if they weren't sticking together for 40, if they were sticking together for 47, it should have been noted by one of these people. Seems to me a fair inference from this record. Now, Dr. Lee went about doing this swatch drawing experiment in a controlled fashion. The key here is that the swatches are the same swatches used by LAPD. We got them from LAPD, as opposed to the sock drawing experiment, uh, where nobody has been able to find the same kind of sock. And that is a material difference because when you're trying to determine drying, you need the same kind of material. So we have the same swatches. We got it from them. Dr. Lee then went about doing a controlled experiment whereby he performed a swatch collection in exactly the same fashion described by Fung and Mazzola by putting a drop of blood outdoors on cement, letting it dry, swatching it uh, in the same fashion they described, and creating a series of outdoor swatches. Then as a control, he took a series of indoor swatches where he saturated the swatches with whole blood. And he performed both experiments simultaneously to see if there would be any differences uh, in terms of volume uh, of blood versus distilled water and found no differences. Essentially within the range of drying times here, what you find is that when you take swatches out of the test tubes after one hour, you see what transfer is as depicted in the, it's all documented in photos. When you take swatches out after two hours, you still see some evidence, but less of uh, wet transfer. And after three hours, none of the swatches uh, reveals any evidence of wet transfer. They're all dry. Now, he also varied the number of swatches in the tubes in order to try to control for how they might have fortuitously been in a tube uh, overnight. Two tubes had one swatch, one tube had two swatches, one tube had three swatches, one tube had four swatches, one tube had six swatches. He informs me that they are plastic tubes. He also varied the size of the tubes uh, to account for differences in circulation, and they all turned out, uh, again, to have the same pattern in terms of drying. He also uh, put, as we indicated, different numbers in the tubes. The fact that the tubes were upright and the swatches were on top of each other is a fact which, in effect, favors the prosecution since it's their contention that swatches creating a sandwich might tend to dry when they're on top of each other uh, more slowly than if they're separated from each other. So to that extent, uh, uh, that difference which we don't think is a material difference in terms of substantial similarity, uh, favors them. Now, the record is clear uh, from Mr. Matheson and from all Is there anything in the California case law that says that if a condition more favors one particular side, I can ignore the substantial similarity requirement? No, but I'm just pointing out that you have to make a discretionary ruling as to whether something is substantially similar or not, whether the uh, differences are material. We don't have to prove identity uh, uh, with respect to the condition. The issue here is whether or not their objections are, are material for purposes of these experiments. And uh, we don't think that these differences uh, are conceivably material for the limited purpose for which the experiment is being offered. And if they think there is a, a, a difference, or they, they can, they're given this set of circumstances, they're perfectly free to do their own experiments to prove ours are wrong in terms of the range of time it takes for a swatch to dry. Now, we've all been to the evidence processing room in the cabinet. It's described as a, uh, a normal room, air conditioned in the lab. It's room temperature, an ordinary cabinet. That was the testimony. No special heating or cooling uh, there. So uh, uh, on the assumption that it's 25 degrees centigrade, he put, Dr. Lee put his swatches in a cabinet that is substantially similar to the cabinet we see depicted in the photographs in this room. If there is some factor here unbeknownst to any of us 
uh, that uh, the evidence processing room for some reason at LAPD was unusually hot or unusually cold and it wasn't room temperature, uh, then they're perfectly free to bring that on to prove that there's a material difference here. But I don't hear any of that and I think the record based on the testimony of everybody and our visits to the lab is that it's room temperature. But don't you agree that ought to be the obligation of the proponent to establish that? Well, the, 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 the record is is that this was a room at room temperature and that uh, uh, and they put it in an ordinary cabinet. So we replicated that condition and that's what the testimony will be. I think we've demonstrated that. Uh, with respect to the argument that the proportion of blood to distilled water on the evidence swatches is unknown, preventing duplication of this uh, condition in the swatch drying experiment, Dr. Lee will testify that the actual swatches in this case and the outdoor swatches started with one drop of blood, which is approximately 0.05 cc's. He gets these numbers from extensive experimentation with blood drops, uh, which he will testify to. And uh, the range of variation ordinarily found is between 0.03 to 0.06. So uh, unless uh, the, the testimony is clear as to the methods used by Andrea Mazzola in wetting a swatch and uh, uh, taking the blood stain. Nothing in that testimony indicates that she would have saturated it uh, with a volume of distilled water uh, that, in Dr. Lee's opinion, could make any difference here, yeah. 10 cc's of water, in terms of the swatch drying experiment. And as I indicated, he did a control by having one set of swatches that were just uh, saturated in blood indoors. So he tried to control for those conditions. Uh, and I think I've addressed the issue of whether the swatches were stuck together or not. I think the record is clear that they noted when swatches were stuck together, and according to them, there's no notation of swatches being stuck together here. So as far as that's concerned, uh, they're free to argue to the jury or bring on a witness in rebuttal to say, I forgot to tell you, uh, and I forgot to indicate in my drawings that the swatches were stuck together. And I think that that about covers it, except for the fact that I think it is a critical issue uh, as to getting a range before the jury as to when these kinds of swatches would dry and when they wouldn't and when they would leave wet, wet transfer and when they wouldn't. And that's the limited purpose for this. And for that limited purpose, we feel that this experiment is substantially similar to the conditions at issue and that the prosecution has not shown that there are material differences that uh, would weigh so heavily in this equation that this highly relevant evidence shouldn't go before the jury. And it's all documented. And finally, the reason that I, this experiment was the last thing Dr. Lee did just before filing his report. So they got this immediately uh, within days of the completion of the experiment with all his notes, all the photographs, all the documentation. And uh, they asked him about it a number of times already, weeks before he came in here to testify. All right. Thank you, counsel. Just briefly? briefly, if you must. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, uh, and I'll, I'll just hit the, the issues very quickly, Your Honor. Uh, the idea that there's a common drop size between 50 and 60 microliters is something that is stated in Dr. Excuse me, Mr. McDonald's book on blood spatter. But I am not aware of empirical data to support that proposition. If Dr. Lee is going to rely on such material, I believe that we're entitled to have that in discovery, and I'm sure he probably provided it to us upon our request. I'm just saying I'm not aware of, of such material. The, uh, I don't want to address what, what we believe to be non-issues, which are the, the questions of Andrea Mazzola saying, her, uh, of Andrea Mazzola's initials not being on the bindles because she didn't bindle vir virtually any of the items there at all, and it's just neither here nor there. It doesn't go to the substantial material of the experiment, and I think we should concentrate on the issues at hand. Similarly, Dennis Fung's testimony that they appeared to be dry, which is what he's saying, but he did not check them, you know, by feeling them, obviously, is again not in any way relevant to the substantial materiality of the test, which is the legal issue that we're dealing with. The swatches, it, it seems uh, very likely, could have 
stuck together or been placed one on top of the uh, each other while they were lying down after being poured out into the bindle, poured out into a bindle and then packaged could have been reconfigured and we'll never be able to reconstruct those set of events and I, I wouldn't expect that anyone could be expected to remember them. Uh, but, but the most important thing I'd, I'd like to say, Your Honor, in response to counsel's arguments in relationship to the freezing and unfreezing, and this is the last point I'll make because I know the court would like to get on with the, uh, the matter. The issue is being defined more narrowly by counsel than it really is. He's, tr he's saying all we want to show is how long it takes swatches to dry, and that's the issue, and therefore freezing and unfreezing is not relevant. The real issue is not how long it takes swatches to dry. No one cares about that. The issue is how do transfers occur in bindles. That's the issue that the defense cares about. That's the issue that parties are going to be arguing about. That is the issue that this experiment theoretically is supposed to provide additional evidence to the jurors about. And therefore, freezing and unfreezing, everything that happened to these swatches between the time that the bindle was created and the time that the transfer was noticed is relevant. And no one is aware of what the effect is on freezing and unfreezing, because a lot of the issues that have been brought up in this case, no one cares about. They haven't been investigated in the scientific literature. There are no experiments that have been done. So we are simply trying to make guesses. Well, this could happen, this might happen. You know, maybe if you did it this way, it would be different or more favorable to one side or the other. The point is we don't know. And this experiment doesn't tell us because it doesn't replicate substantially the material circumstances with respect to these items. All right, thank you, Council. All right, I've reviewed the uh, points and authorities that were filed by both sides and uh, heard the uh, substantial argument. The issue uh, before the court is whether or not the conditions of the experiment uh, as offered uh, substantially replicate the conditions uh, of the uh, swatch drying that was accomplished in this case. Uh, the court is aware from having reviewed the uh, boards that the defense is going to offer photographs of the uh, swatch bindles uh, that are going to indicate uh, some staining within, uh, which is going to indicate that uh, there was some, that the swatches were in fact wet at some point in time while they were within those bindles. And the defense can prove that by those photographs. Um, I'm concerned that the uh, temperature has not been documented and established that the humidity which would have an impact on the drying time has not been documented or established, uh, that we have not determined the blood or liquid content of these swatches nor the uh, particular drop size. I'm also concerned about the upright nature of the uh, test tubes given the, uh, for all the humor about the sandwich problem, it is a, an issue that uh, I'm not clear on. Uh, I therefore find that there is insubstantial similarity and the objection will be sustained. All right, let's have the jury. All right, let the record reflect that we've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know quite how to tell you this. Um, you have a rather unusual distinction. As a uh, sequestered jury, uh, as you know, you've been sequestered since mid-January. And as of yesterday, uh, you have surpassed the amount of time that the Manson jury 
uh, if you recollect from 20 years ago, was in sequestration, so some kind of a dubious record, uh, I'm sure. In talking to uh, some of you individually and in observing you, uh, I know that you are a very tough and tenacious group of people. I know that you've made a commitment to see this matter through. And I know that you are disappointed with the delays that we've had, but I'm sure after I've tried to explain them to you, you understand that there are certain things that just have to be taken up out of your presence and that take a substantial amount of time, unfortunately. Uh, I want you to know that I've expressed again my concern to the lawyers for both sides that we move this case along at a little faster pace. Uh, before me right now, there is a very significant legal issue uh, that I'm going to have to spend a considerable amount of time considering outside of your presence. But I'm going to be doing that this Friday afternoon, and I anticipate working on these matters uh, over the weekend, both Saturday and Sunday, so that we don't take up jury time uh, for those matters. Uh, I want you to know that we're very cognizant of the demands that we've made upon you. Uh, I know that this has not been an easy experience for any of you. Um, probably fun for about the first eight hours, and then after that it became real tough. But each of you uh, has shown us by your endurance and by your cheerfulness every day when you come in here that, that you're still with us. Uh, but I want you to know that we appreciate the burden that we've placed upon you and the demands and the restrictions that we've placed upon you. This is much worse than being in the Army, I'm sure, uh, from your perspective. Uh, but I want you to know that each and every person involved in the prosecution and the defense of this case appreciates your sacrifices, and they keep in, will keep that in mind in the future uh, as they prepare their examinations of witnesses and will hopefully keep their examinations to what is absolutely necessary. All right, having said that, also, uh, Ms. Clark, uh, one of the lead prosecutors, is not available today. Uh, however, the prosecution has uh, decided to proceed in her absence, and she can read the transcript and or see it on TV uh, to catch up with us. All right. Dr. Lee, would you uh, resume the witness stand, please? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Let the record reflect that Dr. Henry Lee is again on the witness stand, undergoing direct examination by Mr. Sheck. All right. Good morning again, Dr. Lee. Good morning. All right, Doctor, you're reminded, sir, that you were still under oath. Mr. Sheck, you may continue with your direct examination. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor, and I hope to conclude the direct examination. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, Dr. Lee. Excuse me, Mr. Sheck, Ms. Moxham, our court reporter, indicates that she's probably able to go through to the noon hour. Great. Your Honor, I, with permission of the court, I'd like to take out another. You may. Mr. Harris. Dr. Lee, you may step down to see that. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Dr. Lee, were these photographs taken uh, on the June 25th visit that you previously have described to us uh, at, Rock, at Mr. Simpson's home? Yes. All right. And could you please, uh, starting with the photograph on the upper left-hand corner of 1356 entitled Front Entrance, Describe for us what is uh, shown on this board. In June 25th, 1994, afternoon, approximately 4 o'clock, I took this photograph. Shows an overall view of this front entrance door. Enter the residence. Dr. Lee, at that time, did you perform any uh, presumptive tests on the doorknobs and lock mechanisms and light switches in this area? Yes, sir. What did you do and what were the results? I did that chemical presumptive test. Generally, 
refer orthotology test, which will react with heme or any peroxidase, a colorless reagent will turn to a blue color. If that turn to blue indicates certain result, if no reaction did not turn blue, means absence of blood. What were the results of your test? Did you test anything on the doorknobs here? I test both outside, inside, doorknob, door hinge, all the area, the light switches, and uh, all this area, metal surface, the door side. Were the results negative? The result? Objection uh, to presumptive blood testing. Oh, well. All my test results were negative. Did you perform, did you examine the staircase uh, going upstairs? Yes, sir, I did. And what did you do and what did you find? I use a magnifier glass, look through every step. Any step have a discoloration or <coughs> brownish color or any other indication, I will perform a test. What results? All negative. Would that be an indication that there was no blood of any kind that you could detect in your examination of the stairs leading up to Mr. Simpson's bedroom? The area I tested, I did not find any blood. Did you do something uh, did you perform a uh, the same examination of the hallway that leads into Mr. Simpson's bedroom? The yes, sir. to date, Your Honor. This is all on June 25th, I take yes. it. Yes. And what 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 were the results there? Negative. Now, <clears throat> call your attention to the foyer floor photograph. Could you tell us what that is? Foyer floor photograph is depict a center portion of the front enter foyer. Foyer. I have to point it out. This is not the imperfection of the floorboard. It's a photograph provided to me <coughs> by Mr. Shapiro. That's an original photograph was taken by LAPD. I use that photograph to locate the floorboard. Floorboard have different number of pit or some type of uh, like nail type of object so I can identify this area. So I was subsequently able to locate the area uh, LAPD tested. Now this is, uh, if one gets close to this photograph, one can detect that this is uh, an evidence card indicating item number 12 and it shows uh, uh, three blood drops in that area. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And so this photograph then, I guess you're saying, is your effort to locate exactly where that was on the floor as you saw it on June 25th. Yes. That, is that right? Okay. Yes. Please proceed. Upon checking the area, I was able to identify the three locations. The three locations apparently being swapped and created a swipe pattern. I was able to recognize that. Compare with the photograph, I was able to identify the location. Did you locate any other reddish stains that were consistent with blood stains in that area? Yes, sir. Are those depicted on the remaining photographs? Yes. Could you please describe that? Subsequently, I noticed there are three additional stamp. This stamp one, stamp number two, stamp number three. This is a close-up view. The last column, top picture, shows this close-up view of this particular stamp. So altogether, if one counts the three 
stains identified by LAPD as item number 12 uh, and the stains that you found, how many blood stains were in this area altogether? Six. Were there any uh, differences that you could detect between the, in terms of size, uh, uh, with respect to these stains? There are three which are already swapped. One, I was able positively to determine the size because the periphery crust still remain. Two other, as you can see, depicting this photo, being swapped around, swapped around. The diameter of this swapped around area is approximately half inch. The original blood drop size is going to be much smaller than what the, they've been swapped. Because when you drop a drop of stand, if you try to swipe it, you're going to create bigger area. The three I examined, I was using scale, was able to determine two smaller one is one fifteen, one of fifteen is in diameter. The other one is one of the ten inches. One of the ten inches, tenth of the inch, and fifteenth of the inch. So it's a relative small blood stain. Now, are some of these blood stains consistent with vertical droplets? They're all consistent with droplet. It's not a regular blood drop. It's a droplet. It's smaller drops. And. So some are bigger, some are smaller? Yes. Would the smaller stains, would any of these be consistent with what is known as a cast-off pattern? Yes. And uh, ca so if, if one had a superficial cut on the side of a finger and shook it in the fashion that I'm doing, let the record reflect that I'm shaking my hand down. Would, could that, does that create cast-off pattern? Yes. And would that be consistent with what you found here? Yes. Uh, could the pattern that you found here be consistent with a superficial cut on the side of the finger? It consistent with a small volume. Is the pattern that you see here consistent with a major cut? No. Uh, yeah, we're finished with this work. Dr. Lee, before I move on to the next series of boards, I'd like to ask you briefly some questions about the Bronco. Did you have an opportunity to personally examine and look at the Bronco? No. Could you do a reconstruction of the Bronco? I cannot do a reconstruction because I did not have a direct examination observation of an original condition. Did you have an opportunity to look at some pictures of the uh, blood in the Bronco? Yes, I did. I looked at uh, some of the photographs sent to me. What is the pattern of the blood stains you saw in those photographs? It's vague. No, it's not. It's vague. Right. Could you, from looking at those pictures, Characterize what kind of blood stain you saw. Still vague or really broad enough. Found it. Date, time, which photos, which part, date, time, which photos, which part of the Bronco? Which photos did you look at? How do I know? Well, <laughs> I uh, don't know. Did you look at photos of the door, the driver, the Anything. driver's door of the photo? Of the, of the Bronco? Yes, I look at some uh, photo appears to be depict a door. All right. Did you look at photos of the console? Yes, I did look at picture to peak portion of the console. Dr. Lee, what is a smear? A smear is a contact with a movement. All right. Were the pattern of blood stains that you saw depicted in the photographs on the door and the console, were they smears? Appear to be consistent with smear. To the extent you could tell from the photographs, what kinds of smears are they in terms of the saturation? 
Uh, only Your Honor, no the from the photographs, could you make a judgment as to whether these were heavily saturated smears or light smears? A consistent with light smear. Now, take for example the console. What kind of surface is that? I don't know. Well, what is a non-absorbent surface? Sustain. What is a non-absorbent surface? In this context, it is. Is a plastic? Could you describe, uh, in terms of absorbencies, uh, can you characterize categories of surfaces? Yes. What are they? Well, you can put in two general categories. Some are absorbent, some non-absorbent. Of course, there are some in between. A surface like plastic generally refer non-absorbent surface, a surface with a tissue, cotton, those clothes, is refer as a absorbent surface. Okay. I'd ask you to assume that the console that you saw in that photograph is a plastic surface, non-absorbent surface. Based on the photographs, can you make an estimate as to the volume of blood that it would take to create the smears, the light smears you saw on that surface? No foundation speculation. I think it's vague because there, there are separate smears on, appear to be on the console. Well, you saw a series of smears on the console? Your Honor, also, no foundation as to which photos. Sustained. Right. Have you seen photographs <clears throat> of the console with I'm not, I haven't let let him proceed with evidence tags on them provided to you from the LAPD uh, appear to be some photographs provided to me by the defense counsel All right. now from those photographs what can you, can you tell precisely what the volume of blood is on those surfaces? Sustained. With these photographs of the console? Yes. Series of smears on the console? Yes. From those photographs, can you tell us precisely how much blood there was on that console? Sustained. Foundation counsel. From the photographs you saw counsel, of- as soon as you say we're not getting past the photographs. What photographs? All right. Did you see photographs with evidence markers labeled 3031? Leading. Overall. Um, I think I saw a photograph in that nature. Did you? Overall. Did you see additional photographs taken on August 25th? Sixth, that had numbers 303, 304, 305. Council, these, these photographs are in evidence on boards. Why don't we just show them to Dr. Lee and say, are these the photographs you saw? Based upon what you saw there as to this area, can you tell us how much blood is there? Yes. Otherwise, the jury has no idea what we're talking about. trying to be expeditious, Your Honor. I think we all have seen these photographs. Well, maybe Mr. Blazier can find it for you. Something else, Your Honor. I thought this was self-evident, but Yes, yes. Thank you.
marked as Defense 1357, entitled Bloodstains on Evidence Bag. So marked. Well, better yet, before we do that, Your Honor, uh, with the Court's permission, I'd like to uh, display Eleven and ten eighty seven. Eleven ten eighty seven is a photograph of the console with tags thirty and thirty one. And eleven sixty seven is the August twenty sixth photographs of the stains on the console. Dr. Lee, I show you first 1087. Is that the photograph we were referring to before with the evidence tags 30 and 31 taken on June 14th? Yes. I'd like to show you <clears throat> the next photograph, which is 1167. Is that the Console picture uh, from the August 26th search with the numbers 303, 304, 305, and 306 on it, the ones we were talking about before. Yes. All right. Now, Dr. Lee, with respect to these photographs, going back to the question I was asking you before, uh, I'm asking you to assume you, you did not actually inspect the physical uh, the console itself? No, couldn't I did get, not. Couldn't get to see the Bronco itself? No. Wait a minute, I objected. Couldn't get Did not see the Bronco itself? He's rephrased the question. Proceed. Did not see the Bronco itself? No, I did not. All right, so you can only base this on the pictures? Yes. And the assumption that this is a non-absorbent plastic surface that I'm asking you to make? Also assuming the color is a true representation. Okay. of the original color. For, uh, in the photographs? Photograph. Right. Based, w given those limitations, based on what you see, can you tell precisely how much blood is on the console? No foundation calls for an opinion of speculation. Or will. May we approach? No. I cannot tell you exactly volume just by looking these two pictures. They are methods. If I have the counsel, I can determine the volume. Can you give us from the pictures an estimate as to, in terms of small or large, the kind of volume that would be required to make those kinds of smears that you observe in the photograph, given the limitations that have been described? Okay, no foundation speculation. Big, small or large. All right. Well. Could those smears be made with less than one cc of blood? Oh. Yes, could be made much less than one cc. Thank you. Now, turning to what is uh, called 1357, uh, the board entitled Blood Stains on Evidence Bag. Dr. Lee, I'd ask you to. Uh, come off the witness stand and describe for us, uh, could you first tell us what are these pictures and where were they taken? This bar consists of four pictures, which was taken February 18, 1995, while I was in Albany Medical Center, exam some evidence sent to me by LAPD. The picture on the upper left-hand corner of this board entitled Bloodstains on Outside of Paper Bag Item 78 bo Boots. What does that show? This is a view of a portion of the brown 
paper bag, which have a labeling, numbering, a set of the initial CY, and uh, some lettering. It described to me this bag seems to call for your set. Sustain, ask a question. Based on uh, the numbers there and the uh, property report records you had, uh, what item did this bag correlate with? No foundation. Oh. Well. Item 78 boot. Ron Goldman's boots? Yes. What, what are the, what observations can you make based on uh, this photograph. This photograph at the opening of this paper bag, near the lettering A-774, here I see a contact smear approximately four inches long. The ruler where indicates shows the length of this contact smear. What is the photograph on the uh, bottom left-hand side here? Bottom left-hand side shows a close-up view of this contact smear area. The photograph, of, sorry. Is there anything else that we should observe about uh, the close-up of this, what you have called, why do you call this wet blood transfers? No foundation. Sustained. All right. The, board contains uh, the phrase wet blood transfers in relation to this picture. Could you please explain that? When I examine this stand carefully, it's a contact smear made of blood. This blood has to be in wet stage to get transferred. Once it's dried, you cannot transfer anymore. So that's why I refer a close-up view of a wet blood transfer. And, and let me see if I understand this. You're saying that what has to be wet in order to cause this kind of transfer stain? Yes, sir. What, the object that is the making? object, the surface, or items, or uh, even a glove, or any object have some wet blood touch this brown paper bag cause this transfer with emotion. And what is the photograph on the upper right hand uh, corner of this board entitled blood stains inside paper bag, item 78? What does that represent? The paper bag, when I look at the inside, I see white transfer inside of the bag. The mechanism of this transfer remains the same. Has to be a wet surface, wet object with some wet blood. I'm sorry, a surface object with some wet blood contact this brown paper by cause such transfer. And what is the picture in the lower right hand that says close up wet blood transfers? The close up shows some of the blood has soaked through other side to the exterior surface. Right. Now, is it a good procedure to put an object such as a boot that is still wet with blood inside a paper bag? So this I cannot say what the LAPD procedure. I did not review it. I'm not come here to criticize anybody. My own procedure, if I collect, I don't put an object wet. And why wouldn't you put a wet object into such a paper bag? You cause a transfer, you change the pattern. If an object has two or three different type of blood, Grouping, because it's transfer, now you may result some false reading. Is that, uh, could create mixtures? With yes. It? 
where there weren't originally mixtures? Yes. Is that what's uh, sometimes known as uh, cross-contamination? Yes. I think we're finished. Dr. Lee. All right, Mr. Sheck, you put up another board. Yes, this would be 1358. And this board is entitled History of Item 47, Blood Drop on Bundy Walkway. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, could you please describe for us uh, this board, starting with the picture on the upper left-hand side titled Item 47 Overall View. What is that photograph? What does it show? Item 47 Overall View is a crime scene photograph taken by uh, the LAPD photographer subsequently provided to me by defense team, which depicts an overall view of this walkway with some number plate uh, indicates certain locations. The photograph uh, immediately to the right, uh, what is that? This photograph also provided by the defense team, it a, shows a close-up view of this 112, photo plane number 112. That's a blood-like drop on the walkway, at the Bondi walkway. Now, on the bottom left-hand side of the board, uh, there is a, a worksheet entitled Collection Note, June 13, 1994. Uh, could you please describe for us what this is? This is a document which provided by you indicates it's a collection note. Well, no foundation for personal knowledge, Your Honor. It's a state. All right, well, you provided uh, the collection notes made at by Dennis Fung and Andrea Mazzola, as well as serology notes made by Colin Yamauchi as part of the discovery process in this case. Hearsay calls for a conclusion, no personal knowledge. Overall. Were you provided with such a document? Yes, sir. Next question. Uh, calling your attention to this collection note of uh, June 13th. Uh, no foundation through this witness. We've already had testimony on this, Your Honor. Oral. Uh, what, is the, what is this note? It's appeared to be a documentation which shows the collection, the location of each stand where they collected, and uh, item number, property, item number, and photo. Your Honor, with permission, I'd like to take one of the yellow marker and just highlight item 47 on this particular note. You may. Dr. Lee, does <clears throat> this indicate but this photograph of uh, referring that to the item 47 close-up photo 112, this does not contain a uh, uh, ID with photo with scale and I, uh, ID. You know, no. This has been gone over. Sustained. The picture pretty much speaks for itself, too, Counselor. Yes. Uh, with a number of swatches, 
used to collect this gain, counted or recorded on this note? No, Your Honor, no foundation. Oh, well, it's not there, but we went over this in cross-examination. I understand. Just moving along and refreshing. No, we don't need to refresh, counsel. No. Dr. Lee, in your opinion, would it be your practice, if you were to take swatches in this fashion, to count and record the number? Not relevant. Oh, I only can testify our procedure. I'm not here to criticize anybody else's procedure. It's a good practice to count the number. And now call your attention to a serology note June 14, 1994, uh, of Colin Yamauchi, and call your attention to the item 47. Have you uh, reviewed this, Dr. Lee? Yes. All right. And are you familiar with the... All right, the record reflected counsel's highlighting that uh, portion on that lower uh, right-hand photograph. Are you familiar with the drawings made by Mr. Yamauchi of the swatches he found in the bindle for item number 47 on the morning of June 14th? Yes. Right. And <clears throat> with respect to... Your Honor, this has been the subject of previous testimony. I have checked on the proof. Overruled. And no foundation. Overruled. I haven't heard the question. With respect to uh, this diagram, on the area indicating samples remaining. Diagram, how, counsel. Sorry? You're talking about Mr. Yamauchi's serology report, correct? Yes. You said diagram. I'm sorry. Proceed. The report is a box indicating sample remaining. All right. Yes. How, how many swatches are indicated there as remaining? Sustained. Sustained. The document speaks for itself, counsel. Well, does the document indicate that seven swatches are remaining? Leaving, Your Honor, some objection. Oh. Yes. All right. In terms of the diagram itself, how many boxes do you see there? I kind of appear to be eight. Is there a notation here? Your Honor, I'm going to object to any further questions on this document. For it speaks for itself, counsel. Well, you're all right. This is foundational. I'm just moving on. Counsel, this we've seen it. You cross-examined Mr. Yamauchi extensively on it. What this witness happens to see there, the jurors have seen the document. The document is here in front of them. Yes. Let's proceed. Well, move expeditiously. Is there one section there indicating that one of those swatches was sampled? Your Honor, that's the problem. Sustained. Next board, please. Just a second. Nope. Proceed. Be 1359. It's entitled History of Item 47 Blood Drop on Bundy Walkway. Dr. Lee, on the left hand side of this board, there is a something in there is a report indicating worksheet by Mr. Yamauchi that's entitled Serology Note of July 21st, 1994. Uh, do you recognize this as a summary sheet indicating uh, a transfer of swatches? This document speaks for itself. Oh, well. Yes. What does it indicate? No foundation calls for hearsay. Sustained. The document speaks for itself, counsel. Okay. There's a section here indicating. Same objection. Oral. Date, time, sample prepared, 7 size description prepared sample, and a diagram of five swatches 
And then the next box indicating date sent. July 24th, 1994. Do you see that? Your Honor, same objections. May we approach? Oral. No, neither of you. Now proceed. And is another box here indicating sample remaining size and description, and that has two swatches. Is no that correct? Foundation. Calls for hearsay, speculation. Counsel is directing the witnesses attention to a particular part of this document. I assume there's a question coming after this. Yes. Now, Dr. Lee, on the right-hand uh, side of that diagram, there is a picture that indicates five swatches, July 27, 1994, Selmar. Did you take that picture? Yes. Could you play, explain the facts and circumstances that led you to take that picture? On July 27, 1994, we had a call order and received that document by the defense team to appear in cell mark to observe the testing and uh, to uh, remove 10% of the sample from each narrative item. Oral. When, when you arrived at cell mark, did you have an opportunity to see uh, these samples unpacked? This particular sample, yes. All right. Did you have an opportunity to photograph them? Yes. As they were unpacked? Yes. What is that photograph we see there? This photograph depicts on July 27, when this sample, number item 47, with a letter H, unpacked, inside contents five swatches. Subsequently, we label together with the cell mark scientist H A, H B, H C, H E, and H D to indicate this H is from 47 and five separate swatches, A, B, C, D, E. Did you subsequently receive a photograph that was taken on August 12, 1994 at the Department of Justice of two swatches from item 47 and the bindle in which it arrived? Yes. Is that depicted at the bottom right-hand side of this photograph? This, this photograph board. depicts a portion view of a Melina envelope with item 47, however, with a letter B as a boy. Inside contains two swatches. Have the uh, next word, please. This would be 1360. Just for the record, I'm going to highlight the item 47 on the word. All right, this will be 1360. Now, Dr. Lee, do you have, you're familiar with the kinds of swatches used by the Los Angeles Police Department for creating the swatches in this case? Yes. Have you actually examined samples of swatches provided to you by them? Yes. Are you familiar with the material? Yes. Uh, do you have experience in how long it would take one of these swatches that had distilled water and blood on it uh, in the fashion described by Ms. Mazzola 
in terms of uh, swatching blood. Do you have some experience in assessing the time it takes such a swatch to dry? Your Honor, I have Jack Lee, Coach. Or will. I have experience swatch, use similar type of carbon swatch myself. All my people, all my students, we determine the time required for a swatch to draw. I don't know what Miss Mazula, I did not observe her to swatch it, so I cannot say I have experience with her. Now, <clears throat> not responsible. In your opinion, how long would it take one of these swatches to dry if it were put into a test tube in a wet state and the test tube was open and the test tube and the environment was a cabinet at room temperature? In your judgment, ordinarily. Council. Be careful here. Okay. Your, Your Honor, may we approach? No. Your opinion, how long would it take? Let's try again. Move on. Move on. Move on. I ask you to assume that a swatch, a wet blood swatch, was put into a test tube and left there for 12 hours, 10 to 12 hours. And I'll withdraw that question for the time being. Dr. Lee, I call your attention now to what is been marked as Defense 1360, a board entitled History of Item 47, Blood Drop on Bundy Walkway, Blood Swatches and Blood Stain Patterns of Wet Transfers. Dr. Lee, could you describe what the first photograph in the middle of this board is? The first photograph depicts in the bar, upper row, is cell mark at that time with photograph got five swatches. And what is the photograph in the lower left hand side here? Second photograph, it's a close up view of the DOJ photograph. Shows the two swatches. In addition, there are some reddish color imprint on this so-called binder paper. Actually, it's a piece of paper. And incidentally, Dr. Lee, uh, what procedures do you use to dry swatches with blood, and how long, in your experience, does it generally take? Not relevant to the course, and, and also, Your Honor. Sustain. Sustain. Now, Dr. Lee. You uh, can ask him what it, what, what's indicated by this photograph. Well, I'm going to get to that, Your Honor, but I think I have, well, we'll Proceed. discuss this later. Now, Dr. Lee, in the course of reviewing discovery in this matter, did you have occasion to review notes made by Gary Sims at the Department of Justice with respect to his observations of item number 47, uh, the bindle and the swatches that he received uh, on August 18, 1994? Calls for hearsay, no foundation. Overall, the fact that he examined something doesn't call for hearsay. All right, and are the do you want an answer to that question, Mr. Sheck? Yes, I thought he said yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And are the 
notes that Mr. Sims made with respect to his observations, the kinds of materials that an expert in your field uh, ordinarily relies upon in forming scientific opinions. Yes. And I'd like to uh, For the record, I'll ask to mark uh, these two pages, 1360A, a uh, document of two pages. All right, Dr. Lee, uh, I'll show you this note. <clears throat> now, are you familiar with it? Yes. All right. Now, with permission, I'd like to read the note and ask Dr. Lee if the observations here are consistent with what he sees in the photograph. Calls for your sustain. No. Uh, does do these notes reflect observations by Mr. Sims that are consistent with what you see in this photograph? Calls for conclusions and objections. Oh, well. Yes. Right. Is there a record here of the wet transfer that you just pointed out to the Sustain. jury and a description of it? Sustain. That's your say. On. The second page of this document, does Mr. Sims indicate with respect to item 49? Your Honor, sustained. Mr. Cochran. Call your attention now to the photograph entitled New Haven on this board. Could you please describe what that is? This is a photograph which I took at New Haven on April 2nd, 1995, when finally the original bindo, so-called bindo, actually it's a paper packet, sent to me, I photographed that, shows I have one swatch left. Now, I ask you to examine this photograph, which I'd like to mark 1360. 60C. Small photograph. That's well, what was B? I think A with the two pieces of paper for Mr. Sims. And I'd ask that uh, this photograph be marked as B. B. Madam Reporter, how's your paper supply? All right. Dr. Lee, what is 1360B? 1360B is a photograph which I took. Shows the interior surface of this paper packet or bindle. With my ruler indicates the presence of some wet transfer imprints. Court's permission, I'd like to put this up for a minute on the other. Yes.
think we're slightly out of focus there, Mr. Harris. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, I'd ask that the uh, you we'll have to use the, the uh, telestrator and focus on two. Put an time. arrow on the items he notes. Dr. Lee, using the telestrator, could you point out uh, the stains of interest and please direct Mr. Harris on? Basically, it shows the four transfer input. Print this out as 1360 C. C. All right, let's clear the telestrator. Dr. Lee, you've now focused in on uh, two of these trenchers. Could you please uh, identify them and describe them? The first one <coughs> appears to be a parallelogram, a pattern of transfer. The second one is consistent with a square shape transfer. Right. Could we print this out as uh, 1360 D. D as in David. D as in David. Go ahead, Mr. Sheck. All right. It doesn't take long to capture. It just takes longer to print it out. No, I understand. All right. Dr. Lee, what is this? Here is another parallelogram transfer imprint. Here appears to be a double triangle transfer imprint. Right. We print that out as 1360E. E as in Edward. Now, Dr. Lee, now, Dr. Lee, I take it that the picture in 1360 that you made of uh, swatches at Selmar and the picture that you took in New Haven as is reflected by 1360A, the one that we had up in the Elmo, both have rulers. Yes. All right. And by means of that as a scale, were you able to do enlargements of, and 
I should withdraw it. And also, the picture from the Department of Justice, I see, has a ruler. Yes. And by means of using those rulers as scales, were you able to do enlargements of the swatches depicted in this board and also the bindle that you saw in New Haven? Yes. Your Honor, I would like to uh, now move to the next board. So marked. Uh, history of item 47, blood drop on Bundy Walkway. Dr. Lee, what is this? Um, before we do, Your Honor, I, have a, I made a mistake. All right, why don't you start, talk to Mr. Shack briefly. It's March well, 9th. Wait, excuse me, Council. Mr. Shack, why don't you confer with your witness for a moment? You in just indicated that you uh, uh, made an error in your discussion. Could you please describe what that is? Just now, I appear, say, April 2nd, 1995. Yeah, our memory served me correctly. That's incorrect. It should be March 9th, 1995. You have it. What does this board represent, the photographs here? This shows the date which when the bindle shipped to me by uh, Johnny Catherine's office, I open up the bindle, paper packet. Inside have a small paper packet, contains one swatch. White transfer was noticed, so I took a series of photographs to show this wet transfer. And one of those photographs was the one we put up on the elbow before. Yes, this is the top one. All right, so photograph. I'm sorry, counsel. Which photograph? He's reflect. He's indicating that 1360. No, I understand. Which is one of the photographs we put up on the elbow. I'm about to say 1360C is a close-up of blood patterns of wet transfer that is reflected on this exhibit in the upper right-hand corner and is so labeled. Yes, sir. And that is the photograph with the ruler. Yes. Now, I think we can move to the next board. On this board, I'm going to object subject to a motion to strike for accurately blowing up the photograph. All right. Now I'd like this board marked as defense 1362. 62. And <clears throat> Dr. Lee, what is this? This is a further enlargement of the photograph just depicts in a previous uh, exhibit the top one of the second column. Right. And Dr. Lee, I'm uh, going to mark a series of, I have seven uh, brown photographs, each separate, and I ask you to tell us what these are. And, uh, First, just generally, and then we'll mark them individually. What are these in general? This in general contains seven pieces of an enlargement of blood swatches. One set labeled H, A, 
through E. Five of them. H A, H B, H C, H D, H E. Are those blow ups of the pictures that we saw uh, in the tray that had the same markings, the one picture you took at Selmark? Selmark, here. yes. All subjects subject to motion to strike the same ground. Your Honor, I would. Blow -ups. We'll proceed. Wasn't this supposed to be done at another time? We'll see. Uh, what are the other two? The uh, other two is the enlargement by same scale, same proportion, the two swatches from DOJ, Department of Justice for Your Honor, these, I'd ask them to mark, uh, that aren't, is this board magnetized, Dr. Lee? Yes. Are these blow-ups of the swatches also magnetized? Yes. Right. And Your Honor, the on the back of the magnetized swatches are labels uh, HA, HB, HC, HD, and HE that correspond with the Selmark swatches. So I'd ask that those be labeled. <clears throat> we'll do 1362 uh, HA, HB, HC, et cetera. OK. So that we'll know what they are. Okay. Thank you. And then the remaining two swatches. Uh, are these DOJ? The DOJ swatches. How about DOJ 1 and DOJ 2? OK. Let me just get a. Uh, 1362 DOJ 1 and DOJ 2. And the record should reflect. I'm, I'm just going to lay them out for a second, Your Honor, if I might, on the jury box so that the jury can see the labels on the back. The labels on the back? No, the labels aren't relevant for the jurors at well, this point. Well, the H, A, B, C. All right. We'll need some foundation as to scale and correlation, counsel. Dr. Lee, could you describe the process by which the swatches and this board were enlarged. They all have a ruler. The red ruler is my ruler. That's a so-called six-inch ruler. So basically, you can look at this. This is a metric system. A one millimeter is equivalent now to eighteen millimeter. That's the ruler enlargement. So the rest of a pattern is a large width. Your Honor, for the record, Dr. Lee produced one of his rulers. Could we yes. mark that as an exhibit? Yes, we'll make that uh, 1362 comma ruler. I take it this is one of your souvenir rulers? Yes, sir. Thank you. And also for the record, I don't know if this was reflected, he was using this ruler to measure the enlargement. Yes. And for the Swatch is enlarged in the same fashion? I did not enlarge those myself. Did you direct that they be enlarged in a one-to-one? -one? Yes. All right. Now, uh, what's your question? <coughs> one -to -one? How, how, what was your direction with respect to these? I said enlarge with the same scale, same proportion. Now, Dr. Lee, <clears throat> What can you tell us about the nature of these wet transfer 
patterns that are depicted on 1362. Those, the mechanism of this transfer, it's relative, straightforward, and simple. A wet swatch have to contact this surface, cause such a transfer. It's no alternative. That's the scientific fact. We see some transfer. That's called mechanism. As far as the manner, they may have different explanation. At this point, no question. Then. All right, next question. All right. Dr. Lee, have you made an effort using these swatches and looking at the transfer patterns to see if you can match up the swatches to the patterns? And could you please explain your analysis? We have seven swatches appear to be four patterns. However, we do see some of the patterns appear to either have a movement or some addition. But we don't have all seven. When this, you say, when you, excuse me, when you say all seven, you mean you don't have seven? I don't have seven perfect pattern, transfer pattern. I have seven swatches. One of those patterns appear to be a mirror image of each other. That's consistent with a parallelogram, which almost fit of one of these swatches. One second, please. The record will reflect that Dr. Lee has pointed to the pattern on the upper left-hand side of 1362, a pattern on the upper right-hand side of 1362, and he is handling a swatch that is labeled H-E. H-E. And because it's magnetized, he's placed it over that pattern. Yes. You can fit here. If this portion of the paper touch this one, because this side going to fit like fit on this side. So that's why we refer a copy and mirror image. The next one I can see could be fit is this one, only portion fit this corner, but the other side, maybe some reason did not have a direct contact, so that this one is a copy. But the record reflect that Dr. <coughs> Lee has been referring here to the swatch labeled HD and is referring to the transfer pattern on the left side of 1362 but is lower than uh, the other one he previously referred to. Why don't we mark these one through four going left to right? That'll be easier if we do that for the record. Okay. Why don't you take a marker and just have Dr. Lee number them one through four starting at the left. The further left hand side one, we mark was one, two, three, four. Mr. Chair. All right. Dr. Lee, you were about to, uh, before I interrupted you, move on to the next swatch and pattern. This was HD, the one you were just referring to. Right. 
As I explained earlier, one and four could be a mirror image. Two may be explainable. Three, if you look carefully, maybe the view is not too good, but you look carefully, appear to be a double image with a triangle shape. So the only triangle I have is this HB. However, this triangle is much bigger than this triangle. Unless this triangle folded in a certain uh, <coughs> condition, which I have no knowledge of it. The rest of four, I can't find any place to fit. By looking at the pattern, looking at the shape and the number, unless have other type of explanation. All right, Dr. Shek, sorry, forgive me for interrupting you at this point. We have a request for a comfort break. So we'll stay in place, and any jurors who need to take a quick comfort break, go ahead right now. And Your Honor, could we take that opportunity to no. approach quickly? <laughs> Next question. Uh, non-responsive. Specifically, what experience, personal experience, do you have in observing and noting the drying of swatches of this nature. Could you describe that experience for us? Oh. A drop of stain, blood stain, found on a surface. If the stain already dry, if you try to transfer to a swatch, you have to wet the swatch. This is not responsive. I don't think it understands. I think he's... State, state another question. The issue, issue is, this witness's personal experience with blood swatching using swatches of this technique, right. this particular size and type, handling, packaging, mm -hmm. et cetera. Dr. Lee, do you have experience with the use of wetting swatches of this nature, swatching blood stains, and then observing how long it takes them to dry? Yes. Could you describe for us your experience in that regard? Generally, approximately three hours should well, be Wait, the answer is stricken juries to disregard. Right. Have you done that? Have you observed others do that? Yes. Answer stand. Next question. All right. And when you have done that and observed others do that, how long does it take swatches of this nature to dry? Sustained. Inadequate foundation. All right. When I say do that, <clears throat> Mr. Sheck, what I'm interested in, I, I personal I experience I'm... swatching, personal experience in the drying process, personal experience then having dried them, then packaging them, personal experience 